Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Ali Cutting, and I'm a master's student here at the Institute for Oceans and Fisheries. Uh, and now I'm very excited to be introducing our presenter today, uh, my supervisor, Dr. Rashid Sumaila. So Rashid Sumaila is a university Killam professor, uh, which for context is the highest honor that UBC can bestow on a faculty member. He is also a Canada Research Chair, Tier 1, in Interdisciplinary Ocean and Fisheries Economics here at the IOF, um, as well as the School for Public Policy and Global Affairs. Uh, widely published and cited, Rashid won the 2017 Volvo Environment Prize and was named a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in 2019. Uh, his research focuses on bioeconomics, marine ecosystem valuation, and the analysis of global issues such as fishery subsidies, marine protected areas, illegal fishing, climate change, marine plastic pollution, and oil spills, quite the, quite the gamut there. And he has experience working in fisheries and natural uh, resource projects in Norway, Canada, and the North Atlantic region, Namibia, and the Southern African region, Ghana and the West Africa region, and Hong Kong and the South China Sea. So between his interdisciplinary approach uh, and his wide ranging travels and experiences, Rashid is always full of great stories, uh, which is fun to hear as his supervisee, uh, but this experience has also infused his style of communication and collaboration with diverse audiences and partners. Um, his talk today will give us a sneak peek, sneak peek into uh, the content of his forthcoming book titled Infinity Fish, Economics and the Future of Fish and Fisheries, which is scheduled to be published come late October of this year. So very soon, just a few weeks away here. Uh, so with that, Rashid, it's a pleasure to hear from you and please take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Alison. Uh, it's really nice that you got to introduce me because actually you've been working on Infinity Fish with me for some time and I, I got you on as an RA to help me with the usual things, but then you dug yourself into the, the book and actually I think you're already an, an expert in valuation also, right? Which is amazing. That's why we involve students in things we do. So. That's really good, well done. And uh, thank you all for coming. All right, so here we are. <clears throat> the title is uh, Getting Values and Valuation Right, Fundamental to Achieving Infinity Fish. I'm sure many of you have been thinking, what is this thing, Infinity Fish? So you get to that, right? So, and, and this actually is one of the, I think it's one of the chapters in the book, as you will see. Now, uh, let's go to the next one. So this this is the cover of the book. This is the cover of the book, and uh, as uh, as Ali said, it's uh, supposed to come out this month. So yeah, I think it will come out this month. Everything being equal, you never know until you see the thing come out of production. So but we are very close. And so, yep, that is how it will look <laughs> after, after this lecture. The nice thing is uh, I'm really happy to be talking about it for the first time in a public place here at home, you know, so that's quite something. And at the end, I will, I will tell you who made this to happen. So they say charity begins at, at home. I already have a number of talks lined up. I'll be talking about the book. So, but it all started here and that is nice, yeah. So in the book, I, I, I just have to, I had a, a big portion of acknowledgement in a book like this, it's science-based. It's never really the work of one person now. So, so it's, it's usually a whole group of people. And so in the book, I have a page or two actually, at least one and a half pages, if I remember well, of acknowledgements, you know, all the people who have contributed, all the discussions, talking on the corridors and, arguing in, in seminars, uh, you know, feuding about ideas, all those things contributed and shaped this. So, so uh, students in particular, postdocs, collaborators, funders, institutional homes like IOF, Fishery Center, Policy School, all those things, uh, family, my own family, I, I, in the book I said that I usually, that's the first people I bounce ideas with. So. It, it took a village to do this, really. So I want to beforehand thank 
the whole village huh? uh, for helping me to get this done. Uh, the second thing is I thought I should uh, read the dedication. Uh, those I dedicated this book to, and it's essentially everybody. For all the black, brown, and white women and men, youth and adults working day and night to make the world a more just and sustainable place. I believe all of you on this line are part of this. And, but, but if you are not helping to make the world a better place for as many people as possible, and making it sustainable, whilst you do that, then this book is not for you, okay? <laughs> it's, it's almost a joke, but I, I mean it. Now, infinity fish, what is that? What is that? Uh, my starting point in thinking about infinity fish is actually this very simple model. Some of you have heard me talk about it as my favorite model. I love it because it's simple to the point anyone can understand this. And it boils down our relationship to nature in general, but here the focus is on the ocean, to two very simple processes, what we do with nature and our ocean. We go to the ocean and take all the good things we like, we need, we desire, we take from the ocean. What is the fish, which is our main topic here, but think of all the natural resources and services we take out, the oxygen we, we breathe, that is uh, a lot created by the ocean. We take all those, two, those things in, into the economy and we do what we do with that. Uh, we, 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 we do processing, we do wholesaling, and we cook the food, we eat them, we do our cultural stuff. And all of those processes actually lead to creating waste in one way or the other. What I see or two, what is plastic in the ocean, what is oil spills. And where do they go? They go back to the ocean. So good things come from the ocean, bad things go to the ocean. So it really means that if we want infinity fish, if we want the ocean to continue to give us the services and, and all the good stuff, we better do the taking wisely and, and do as, min, as little of the pollution as possible. And, and that will then make it go on forever to infinity, all right? So to me, the basic definition, the condition for achieving infinity fish is that the current generation, we those alive now, should pass on a healthy ocean to our children and grandchildren so that they too can have the opportunity to do the same, right? And if every generation has the opportunity to do the same and they learn from the past, we are likely to have infinity fish, which is having the, the, the benefits we, from the ocean through time to infinity, all right? So slowly I'll build up uh, the definition as we go. Now, the origins of infinity fish concept, where did it start? Uh, incidentally, actually the idea, this concept started uh, in the mother continent, in the old continent, uh, I like to see Africa as the mother of all continents, uh, where we all started. So we are all Africans. All of you on this line, you are Africans. That is where it started with people. And people migrated and left and did all sorts of things. And, and so we are all Africans. Actually, Mandela likes to say that a lot in, in those days when he was alive. So, so it started there. And how did it start? I got invited to come and give a talk uh, at National Fisheries Day in Namibia. If you know Namibia, there are two things uh, among the many things it is known for. Two are fish. It is a big fishing nation because about 10% of its GDP is actually supported by fishing. So this is very important. Uh, I make a joke and I, I used to go there every year and I, I used to say that anytime I got to Namibia, if by the, by the next day, the next 24 hours, if I don't see the fisheries minister on the front page of the national newspaper, then he or she is out of town, right? That is how important fish is. And, and, and diamond is also important. So the two are important. So I was asked to come and give this talk. And I go in there, not knowing that there was already a lot of local politics between the mining sector and the fishing sector because they, they intersect on the ocean where they do their activities. They don't like each other. So I land there, but I, I know quite a bit about Namibia and its fisheries. And one of the things I told them in my talk, and this was like, like I mean, I, well, I said, you know what, guys? I want to tell you today that fish is more valuable than diamond. 
and they were shot to hell. I mean, the diamond people were really <laughs> not happy. The fish people were pleasantly surprised. And, and how did I justify that statement? Uh, what I told them is, fish is renewable. Everybody knows this. And if we manage it wisely, it's going to feed us, for example, give people jobs. It's going to give us benefits through time. And anything that gives you benefit through time, to, that is to infinity. Even if the net benefit is small, it will sum up mathematically to infinity. Therefore, infinity fish. That is the, really where this came from. And then I said, okay, diamond actually is not forever, as we are being told in popular palace. Oh, diamond is forever. No, if you have a deposit of diamond, and you take one ton of that diamond, that diamond is gone. Your, your, your reserve goes down by one ton. So, so I said, diamond is actually not forever. And I know that many of you will say, oh, but I can, I can sell the diamond and invest the money, save it, and, and that will give me a flow of benefits. And I said, I know that governments don't save money. They, they're always in deficit, so don't give me that but the fish will feed people through time if you allow it. And so these were the two justifications. And uh, the room when, I, when we finished, the fish people wanted to, they took me away in the room for a meeting, took my talk and the diamond people wanted to knock me off if they could, right? So that actually is the origin of the concept, infinity fish. Fish forever, benefits forever. And, and it employs more people. Aha, another point I made was that, uh, I asked the, the, the room, how many of you have seen diamond in your life? And virtually very few people raised their hand. How many of you have eaten fish this week? And it was virtually everybody. So diamond is very elitist. It's just for a few group who take all the benefit and run off. If you go along the coast of any coastal countries like Canada, or West Africa, or Southeast Asia, tons of people actually benefit from the fish. They can catch it, take it home, cook it, feed the family. So that also makes fish more valuable than gold. All right, so that was uh, the beginning. Now, so that kind of was the theme that I tried to develop in this book. And in the book, we have, I have 70 chapters in all, the intro and the epilogue, and then I have 50 main chapters. And these were organized into, into a number of sections. The first one is broadening the scope of what we value. You know? So, and in there, uh, I have two chapters. As I said, the title of this talk is the first, the chapter two and chapter three were in there where I gave examples of how to broaden this. I'll talk a bit more about chapter two in particular as we go. Then the second big part is uh, introducing the concept of intergenerational discounting. To me, this is the heart of the book, actually. It's all about how we discount future flows of benefits, and I'll spend some time on that, and, and what it means, right? So, so the two chapters, they are a bit theoretical and applied. I uh, had examples in there. So making future generations count via discounting to ensure Infinity fish started with a static model because actually I was searching, working my way through. After this static model was completed, I shared it with faculty at the fisheries center then, and then they read it and Carl Waters got really excited about this. He came to my office and then we, we turned that static model into a dynamic model, which, uh, which is the second chapter. So, so and uh, of, uh, which is the, th the third chapter of the book, I think. So that's that. Then the, the second big part is applications of this intergenerational discounting approach. But the first paper was quite an interesting one. When I published the, 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 the third chapter, I got an invitation. Uh, Ross Naylor of Stanford actually uh, invited me to come to Stanford and give a talk on this. And when I got there on the first row, uh, Kenneth Arrow himself was on the first row of the lecture room. And, the kind of arrow is a Nobel Prize winner who even among Nobel Prize winners is highly respected. So that gives you the idea. He was there. And when I gave the talk, he said, he, he said, oh, you know what? How about you do a paper that shows the impact of, uh, if, if, if a fish decline, has declined, what are the reasons? Is it discounting or is it really ineffective or bad management? So I came to UBC. In my next class, I mentioned this in the class, and answer will come, 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 wrong, come wrong. 
Cameron was in the class and he got excited about this. So we went off and actually used the court stocks of Newfoundland, the collapse, and, and demonstrated that collapse. What are the reasons? Is it discounting or mismanagement? And, and so that's chapter two. So that's the student who actually contributed to this book. He's now his own uh, professor in his own right in Florida. So you have uh, stories behind each of these chapters. And that is, uh, the, 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 and then in the and the, in this section, what I did was okay. So so let's say you 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 now have good valuation. You have, you have got your values right, your valuation right. Now that will set you, put you in a position to take broader issues that will help you really ensure infinitive issues, such as putting in place a good governance system, right? Addressing the common property issue, which which is an issue economists, fisheries economists uh, spend a lot of time on because we all own the fish is generally not managed as well as if only one person only, right? How do you deal with that? And, and fisheries subsidies, do you know that I can't do this talk without talking about fisheries subsidies? It's important, it's topical, it's current. The WTO is talking about that, that's another chapter. Rebuilding, many of our fish stocks are, are uh, have been depleted in Canada. We did a paper, uh, me and Louis there, looking at three stocks in the West Coast and three stocks in the East Coast that have been depleted and we did the economics of rebuilding. Them. So that's the kind of thing you find that. Oil spills and pollution in general, plastic, how to deal with that and to avoid that. Illegal, illicit trade. And so there are seven chapters in this where once you have your valuation and values right, then you can set up a system that will allow you to take out all these things that are negative. Climate change, a huge challenge and obstacle to achieving infinity fish. How do we deal with that? So these are the big sections in the book. And then I close with, the, with an epilogue and where or as a knowing the cost of everything, but the value of nothing, you know? And this is something I, I kind of, uh, I was playing around uh, uh, Oscar Wilde's uh, quote who, where he says, economists know the price of everything, but the value of nothing. I mean, this quotation, I, I, I've been fascinated by it because I, I think it captures a lot of the issues we, we have in economics and in politics and in finance. I mean, you see the debate in the US now about, uh, $3.5 trillion is a lot of money. We can spend that. Where will the money come from? It's $350 billion a year uh, for, a, for a, an economy, which is trillions of dollars. And the things this thing is going to do, actually, a lot of them are really valuable, right? But what we know is the $3.5 trillion and every, and people are kicking against it. That's the knowing the cost of things, but the value of that. Okay, of course, economies, we know the, the price of things, some things, and we know the value of things, but, but the point is well made. So that was my epilogue and, uh, epilogue and I, I got the freedom to play around a bit there. Okay, so that is setting the stage. You now know what is in the book uh, in the main. So let me dig a little bit. You can see that there's a lot of material here. I'm not going to be able to talk about the whole book. I'll just pick a few. The values and valuation is important. So the first question I, I try to address in chapter two is, is the economic theory of valuation adequate to ensure infinity fish? Now, when you look at the literature, you see the economic theory calls for a comprehensive compilation of all values into what is called total economic value. So, and that the theory stipulates that the total economic value should include market, but not only market, also non-market values, direct use values, like the fish you catch and eat, and the indirect ones, all the others. Uh, services that help us like cleaning the, 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 the water and so on. So mm -hmm. habitats, some habitats help us do that. So, so the indirect values. You also have to consider the option values for future generations. And the existence value, you know, the seals and the whales have a right to be here like us, right? They're living things. So, 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 so existence value of nature itself. And then the value we pass on to the next generation. So, so my reading of the economic theory is that actually it's comprehensive enough. I mean, we can argue about that. 
if we did it properly, according to theory, I think we'll be able to, to take care of our fishery resources so that we achieve infinity fish. I know this is debatable, but that's fine. Now, how about the practice of valuation? Is it adequate? And my answer is really, this is where a lot of our problems are. There are solid challenges to valuation. Difficulty in determining all the things people actually value, right? So who am I to know all that people in Prince Rupert, how they value their fish, right? You know, so that is already a challenge. And even if you knew that, I mean, many of us argue that some of these things are simply too, Invaluable. You just can't put a dollar value on them. That's an argument. Uncertainty, lots of unknowns, known unknowns and unknown unknowns, and, 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 and so we are. And then even where we have enough inf good information, there's misinformation and truths. You know? We are moving according to somewhere in the post-truth world. It doesn't matter. You know, you tell people this is a coffee cup, they tell you it's a banana until you ask them to eat and nothing you tell them changes their mind or they move on to the next line, right? So these are all challenges. And when the rubber hits the road, certain values are given more weight, e.g. when you have to decide between current values and future values, most of us choose current values. How many times have I been told, Rashid, why do you care about the future? What will we feed our fishes today, right? As if today and, and tomorrow are not connected, right? So, so you have that private benefits. Right? Take the fish and convert it into capital, put it in the bank or build a house, right? Versus the general societal values that we get from them. Uh, salmon for, for seal versus salmon for, for, for people, right? This is a debate that is raging on, on our coast and in Canada and around the world. The, the, the seals are eating all our salmon, so let's knock them off so we'll get more salmon. Come on, who gives you that right, right? Existence value. So, but, but when people are faced with that, we all know where it goes. And that is a big challenge for valuation. And this is not just talk. So I say, Robert hits the road shows up in the literature. So what I did here was a very simple analysis. So I just looked at the, I think, top nine journals, environmental, economic, and natural resource journals. They are publication from 1994 to 2003, over 10 years at the time. And just say, how many of these papers mentioned anything other than market value, the, the, the price you get when you take the fish in the market? And even I was shocked at what we found. Just 1% of the papers said anything other than market value. This is the rubber, he's the road. We talk about total value, cultural value, all these things are important. But when we come down to doing the work, we just concentrate only on the market value, only on the price. So, so that, that, that was shocking. But to give us a bit more hope, I split the two periods into the first five and the, and the, and the second five. And that's what you see on this uh, this simple graph. So it looks like we are increasingly actually do including this. And the first time I put this up, I remembered one of the audience said, you know what, Rishi, this increases actually because of your group at UBC, right? So, so essentially there are a few groups around the world who are pushing this and, and it's improving. I think it's much better now, but we're still far away. You know, most of us just look at the market value, you know. Now, <clears throat> I want to quickly give you an example of this market value and the market value thing. This is work we have do, been doing with the First Nations Fisheries Council of British Columbia, talking about uh, reconciliation day and First Nations indigenous people in Canada, in North America and around the world and the experiences and what they face over time, right? Uh, this work and this book actually has borrowed a lot from, from, from knowledge, indigenous knowledge. For example, this discounting, indigenous uh, thinking actually talks about managing nature for the seventh generation, which is clearly the kind of thinking I, I build into this book that it's not just about the current generation. You have to think of all generations. They talk about the seventh generation. So, so, so and this work, we, we were doing together with the First Nations um, uh, Fisheries Council. This is ongoing still. We organize a number of workshops here at UBC. Uh, a number of you are aware of this. Diane in particular joined some of the workshops. And they, what they wanted us to work together and design is a valuation approach. 
which is simple, which they can use in their communities and which captures more than just the price of say salmon, right? So we together, we put our heads together and came up with a very simple approach based on uh, survey methods. So the step one in that thing is very simple. Just identify the values that you, you assign, the, the values you get from your fisheries. So you have to go into the community and conduct this survey of a cross section of the population and get what they think. And I think this is very important because you have to ask people. You can't believe it. There was a time I was just doing a little experiment on campus here. I just see somebody and say, hey, do you care about fish? I say, oh yeah, I do. Why do you care about fish? And people tell me, oh, I enjoy eating fish. You know, and fish makes money for our businesses and that is good. There was one person that really gave me a surprising answer. He said, I love fish because I love the smell of fish, right? This is quite a, an amazing answer that I never got from anybody. So, so how do you incorporate this, right? We have to identify this. Once we do that, now method, the second stage is to allocate a budget to the people in the survey, say $100 and we say, you identify six values, including market, but all these other cultural, environmental, governance, social, health. So how will you spend your $100 on each of these? So each person allocates them. And then, and then we move on in, in, in the third, in the third uh, approach. We, we, de we then normalize their, their numbers against the market price of salmon, right? And because that will then give us the relative prices. And then we, we can then add up this weight and then multiply that by the price in the market to get what the people perceive as the total value of their fish. We, we did a pilot project already in a community in BC. And, and there we found a salmon that is uh, sold for $3.7 per pound actually ended up with a whole value of 35.6, uh, 35.63 dollars per pound, which is nearly 10%, 9.5%. So that's a, the kind of simple approaches. And I love them, simple approaches. I'm not interested in complicated mathematics or that's not my issue. I wanna do work that really helps to improve the situation on the ground. And I think this is one good one. We had a meeting last time with DFO about this and they're very interested in how this, so watch out this space, we're, we're working on that. Now, we are going into discounting now, which is uh, which is a big big part of this, and uh, the use of environmental resources involves decision making over time. It's mainly because what we do today has something to say about what happens tomorrow. That's why this is so interesting and fascinating field of study, right? So time is important, even for non-renewables like Damon, like I alluded to. Once you extract it, you deplete it and it's different. Next year you go, you may have to dig deeper to get the next one ton, right? So, and for natural, for renewables like salmon, that is obviously time is so important. And, and, and why? Because depletion of non-renewable resources and then you have biological and other physical, physical things happening to the system. Even if you don't fish salmon, the biomass will be changing over time because of all the other influences. Now, this is the one of the two equations I think I have in the talk. This is our basic bioeconomic equation and it simply tells you the MPV is your net present value. And what you do in, in, in these bioeconomic models is you set up a model and you calculate the benefit you get each time, the cost of you, the cost you will incur in order to achieve that benefit, right? And then you find the difference year by year, but because a dollar to you today is not the same as a dollar to you coming in 10 years, you have to do something we call discounting. You have to collapse all this flow into one number, which is the net present uh, value. And to do that, this innocent looking D is what is called a discount factor. Okay, and this discount factor is then multiplied. It's like a weight. Uh, it reduces the weight of your benefit with time. Because why? What, what you are paid today is more valuable than you than what will come next year and the year before. 
And so this D is a discount factor and you can calculate it very simply by this formula, right? So you have the discount rate, which is like an interest rate, you know, annual payment. So, you, you, and then you use this formula, you can get your discount factor and you have that equation. This innocent D actually is quite powerful in determining how your analysis goes. So let's see how. So the problem with discounting, many environmental economists have talked about this, you know, discounting allows the aggregation of a series of future net benefits into the present one, like I, I just talked. And cost benefit analysis outcomes depend greatly on which particular discount rate you use. Low discount rates generally value future benefits higher than high discount rates. And herein lies the problem. So if you have a long-term uh, problem like climate change and you are checking this, it's going to tell you not to do not, nothing, anything or nothing about things that will happen in the distant future. And this is problematic because we know climate change is cumulative. The same thing with rebuilding fisheries. So why do people discount? Yeah, because people have a positive rate of time preference. In general, we want a our money now and then, then our benefits now and then tomorrow. We want to fr front load our benefits and we want to back load our cost. If you read the, 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 the newspapers, you see a lot of this actually playing out in, in the popular, popular media. The people are arguing really about this. I want to take a businessman, my oil sons will get benefits today. And how about the cost? Hey, that's somebody else's problem, backloading cost. And, and so this is a powerful thing that we need to understand why. And another reason is if you have your money now, you can invest it. You can use it to pay graduate student to pay for you to get a degree and increase your market value. And there's also uncertainty, right? Who knows tomorrow, as we say in West Africa, who knows tomorrow, right? You know, uncertainty. Uh, you may not even be here to enjoy the fish. So all this is, that. so there are good reasons to discount, right? And in our method, we are not disputing or fighting this now. And, and, and in the literature, you find efforts to deal with this. Some have advocated for lower discount rate, but how low? I think our method helps with that. Some are saying, why do you discount? Don't discount at all. Zero discounting has its issues. We came in with the intergenerational discounting, and I think there are versions of intergenerational discounting. Then there is gamma discounting, which was developed by Weisman at Harvard, right? Uh, we lost him years ago, but that's another one. Then hyperbolic discounting. So, so there are a number of economists who are trying to really take this, but I tell you the mainstream just does the conventional stuff. They just take a number, maybe market rate, put it in there and, and that's it. I'm, I'm not happy with that because this is so important and, and some of us are not. So why am I not happy? Just look at this picture very quickly. Let's say you have a flow of benefits. You have one unit of benefit coming to you. This can be a trillion dollars or it can be hundred dollars. One unit, just to make our analysis simple. If you, every year you get a dollar, that's the flow of your benefit without discounting. Now, if you use a 7% discount rate, which I believe that's what I did here, seven or 8%, this is the flow of the same unit of benefit over time because we want to front load our benefits. Benefits now are more valuable than benefits in the future. So if you are coming 100 years ago, uh, 100 years in the future, fish, fish now don't seem to be, we will discount it because uh, before you come, right? And, and we take it and have. Uh, 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 enjoy it now. So, so that is part of the reason many environmental economists are worried about this. Now, if you take the area under that curve, for every 20 years, and assume that you have a generation of fishes, that fish for 20 years and they retire. If you take the area under that one, where there's discounting, this is what you get. The first generation run off with this in terms of net present value, second generation, that third generation, that is what the fifth generation will, will, will take. And this, the reason why this is a problem is we use this to decide policy. So then our policies are also front loaded and they are against future generations interest. And that is, uh, that is, that is a problem. But actually, and this for me, for this approach, this was where my aha moment came. So I, I looked at this and said, this is really unfair. You are waiting 
the current generation so heavily? And then I ask the question, but is this truly unfair? What makes it unfair? And what I then did was to say, hey, how about if, you, if we calculate our net present value using different discounting clocks for each generation? At the moment, we set time zero here. We, we decide, we are at the reference point and we discount for everybody. We are discounting their fish as if it is ours, which is not the case. So I said, ha, ah, how about we introduce a discounting clock for each generation? So this is those 20 generations. Actually, if you start counting everybody's fish, when they get into the system, until 20 years they vanish, you see that they all actually get the same amount. So the problem is not just the discounting per se, it is the fact that we discount our grandchildren's fish as if it is ours. You know, so that 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 was the, 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 the thing I, I said, okay, if we can if we can rectify this and really make sure that I'm not eating my granddaughter's fish, it is her fish, give her the right to to, to get her fish, then then actually discounting is not necessarily a big problem. So that was uh, how our approach was developed. And then mathematically, very simply. So if you have just two dead generations, you start one generation when they are here, you count their money, you discount it, that's their thing. Then when they go, you have a new generation, you start the clock, do their own. And that is the, the, the static version of this uh, intergenerational discount. I, because of time, I just have one or two figures here in the paper, in the chapter, you can, you can see it. And, and, and remember each of these chapters are actually, I think ex except one, uh, each of the chapters have actually been published in peer reviewed journals. So, so there's a lot of backing, scientific backing for it. So here we did a very, I did a very simple experiment where I took Icelandic ecosystem and say, if we, if we, if they continue fishing status quo as now, that's how the, 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 the harvest, the quantity of fish they can get from that system will continue to decline. There's too much fishing effort, messing up the habitat and so, so this is why. But if they were to make a policy, take out bottom trawlers, reduce cap capacity for half, a, uh, half, half the capacity in our fishing capacity for 25 years, their catch of course will drop to this level and after 25 years, the model predicts there will be better fish and then you can sustainably catch this amount of fish through time. Now, if you do the economies, as I've told you, this is the area under the curves. If you do the conventional approach of discounting, the status quo, as bad as it looks, is still better, you know, than if you rebuild, which gives you this total net benefit. Using the conventional approach, you will not rebuild. You just and this is what happened to cut stocks, right? When we did our, our, our case study there. But if you use our approach, then this is the status quo, the total benefit, and this will then be the the the, the rebuilding. Then is is wise to rebuild. You you get it. So just by counting future generation fish as their fish you actually can improve the situation for them and for all of us, essentially. So this figure I like a lot, but it's a bit difficult to, to explain. What I did here was to say, look, assuming we have 50 generations, that leave 50 years, I'm not talking of 50 by 50 years, 2,500, no. I'm talking about future generations. Say you start with one this year, they live for 50. Next year you have one, they live for 50 years. So we'll have a total of 100 years in this thing. But what I calculated here is the net present value. This one is the net present value, this point of the, of the current generation who live for 50 years. I just did the total calculation there, NPV, I put it here. Each dot is the sum of all the benefits, the net benefits under rebuilding and then under status quo. You see, the current generation, see the gap. For the rebuilding, they will have to give us something. This is part of the reason we're struggling with dealing with these problems. So the next year, a new generation come and I calculate their own, they get that. And on the status quo, and, and, and this is on the status quo, they get this and that. By the eighth generation that comes into play, then you are balanced. The eighth generation is indifferent between rebuilding and not. And all other generations thereafter, 
will have a bonanza. They, they will be happy. You rebuild, they manage it well, and they get this flow to infinity. Infinity fish is achieved and the rebuilding with good management and status quo just destroys infinity fish. So that, that is that. All right, so for the sake of time, let's see. Yeah, so here we are. So I will now just quickly wrap up uh, and, and give you a bit more here. So getting values and valuation right is crucial to ensuring that infinity fish is not lost, okay? And remember this, I think I've just given you a few chapters and, and just bits of that. So, but the whole book is arguing this, and this will set the tone for policies we implement uh, to guide us, you know, how we interact with the ocean and the fisheries, right? So my argument is get the values and valuation right. That will then give you the basis to develop all the other things you need to ensure this, to ensure there's no oil spill or minimum oil spill, plastic pollution, illegal fishing, no bad subsidies that lead to overfishing. All those things are predicated on getting the values and valuation right. Otherwise we do what we are doing now and that will not give us infinity fish. So it will help us to take actions that reinforce positive feedback from people to the ocean and vice versa. And this is uh, chapter 16. I think I'm taking this idea from chapter 16 of the paper where we develop a very simple model and say, if you take the ocean and, and people, you know, they, they, the reason the ocean has issues is because we, the people, we go there, we take the fish, we use the controllers. Some even use dynamite to kind the poison to kind the fish, right? And so how do we change this? By understanding the values and putting in place systems to make sure that these things don't happen so that we are policies, we don't go giving subsidies that encourage overfishing to a to a, to a valuable resource that is common property, which under market, pure market conditions, we have problems managing our fisheries, right? Because the people will raise for the fish. It's not your fish until you catch it. On top of that, you pour in fuel on the fire by giving subsidies. And, and the subsidies we give, a lot of it goes to large scale fisheries, industrial fisheries. 80%, the estimate, uh, Anna may be on this line, her PhD work. 80% of the global subsidies go to the big industrial fleet, only 20% to the small scale coastal ones, disadvantaging the people who are really fishing to feed their families, sell to the local market with less of many of the negatives, and then we are disadvantaging them. We are also disadvantaging women, actually, with this subsidy. Why? Because most uh, women fishing, uh, compared to more women fishing small scale fisheries than in large industrial, you know, this is again Sarah Harper's work uh, in her PhD on women in fisheries. And so when you give the bulk of the money to these large scale ones, you are disadvantaging women all over the world, especially in the developing world. And this is the, I think, this is the craziest thing any policy can do, given the disadvantages that women face already all over the world again. I saw a report where, according to them legally, only six countries in the world that women are treated the same or fairly with men, only six countries. This is legal. We are not talking about all the other things, social, cultural, religious disadvantage. And then we take our tax money and aggravate this. Not good. And also we disadvantage the youth because you don't start by buying a big industrial trawler flying and running all over the place. You, you start with a small boat, so that is another disadvantage. So there are social issues there, rather than the current situation where, and if you give the subsidies to the coastal, uh, the big fleet, what you do is you disadvantage the small scale fishers, make them less vi vi viable, you know, and, and, and then they, they get poorer and they hang on the last fish, which is a negative feedback from policy to people, to nature. No, use that subsidy to strengthen the fisheries, put up MPAs that will uh, ensure some insurance, protect the system, help people to go to, to school and have skills so that they, they won't have to hang on the last fish. Anyway, I could go on and on, but I shouldn't uh, give, give time for us to have a 
discussion. So thank you very much for your attention. And thanks to the Fish 500 Seminar Committee, especially Catherine, for twisting my arm to give this talk. Catherine, you did it, right? I'm glad you did, actually. You know what? You made me to now give this talk for the first time here at home, right? And, and that is just the beginning of talking about this, uh, this uh, the book and all the ideas and the many, many contributions of all of you. Thank you so much. And uh, back to you. Thank you so much, Rashid, um, for this fantastic talk. And thank you. Uh, congratulations on your book as well. I'm really glad that um, you, you made the time to write a book about this really important topic. Um, and I feel very grateful for you giving this presentation at home first, yeah. um, so that we get to be the first ones to, to hear you give this talk. Mm -hmm. um, I see that we have two hands up, so we'll take Nicola first and then go over to Sarah, please. Hi, uh, it was a great talk, Rashid. Um, what I was wondering about was how does uh, this scenario fit into your framework where, for instance, in the Bahamas, uh, the Queen Conch is very valuable socially, culturally, economically, um, but it exhibits, and it's overfished, heavily overfished, but it exhibits very strong alley effects. Mm such that, you know, even if we were to stop fishing it, there's no guarantee that it would re rebuild. So what happens, like, in terms of what would that framework look like? What would that scenario look like in your framework? Yeah. No, this is, uh, thank you for the question, Nicole. And, and, and I love this Q&A session because they kind of pushed the idea and it improved things, right? So if, if, if you have already, if you have taken the fish stocks to a state where it cannot come back, then not much help can, can you cannot get much help, right? Because so so that that is, you know, you go to Hong Kong, the airport there, that's they reclaim it from the ocean and they put an airport. So no matter what you do, the fish will not come there, right? Fish that way there. So so that is the, the, the thing we are struggling with. It's better you take care of this thing before they get endorsed. Caught stocks of Newfoundland. I mean, since '92, they've never come to any uh, reasonable fraction of what they used to be. So, we can overdo it to a state where where nature cannot come back. But if we don't get to that, then the method will help because uh, nature is is quite kind also in general. If it's not too badly done, nature normally comes back. So, uh, I don't know whether this answers you, but we can we can talk more about this uh, outside of this, Nicole. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Sarah. Thanks, Rashid. You always do such an amazing job of explaining economic concepts to non-economists. And I thank you for that. It's, it's so easy to follow you. So it's wonderful. So my question is, um, obviously, one of the really big challenges is to convince current generations to forego benefits for the sake of future generations. Hmm. Um, and I guess what I would love to hear are some real world examples of, of where that has been done successfully. And like, what are the, the elements or what are the, yeah, the elements basically that allowed for that? Because I know sometimes governments impose yeah. that on, on um, people, so, you know, shutting down the salmon fishery, for example, um, is kind of imposing um, that on current generation for the sake of hopefully rebuilding for future generations. Yeah. Um, but I'm also interested in where case studies where we have convinced people that this is the right thing to do and, and what hopefully I'm making sense. But yeah, yeah, no, you're yeah, making sense. It's uh... This giving up on the current generations versus the, the future generation. You know, the, the big disadvantage the future generation have is that they are not here. They are not here to vote. They are not here to argue. So the only hope actually they have is those among us who really strongly believe this and, 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 and push for it and almost compel our governments and society to move. So, so Civil society action is very important. All of us should contribute. This is why some of us don't get to sleep much, right? Because you want to really 
uh, move this. So it's us, the people. Otherwise, it's, I think it's tough to happen. I, I give you that one, right? But uh, there are examples. This, the Norwegian spring, spring spawning herring was one good example. It nearly collapsed. It really went down. To, but they managed to shut it down for more than 10 years, I believe. And it's come back since then, and everybody is happy. So, so but you know, Norway, Iceland, these are already rich countries. They can afford that. And so take that to a developing country where people are really struggling, right? And that is not easy. So my, 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 my hope is people, we, the more we, and a big portion of us are convinced to push the levers and the, the more we'll get this. And, uh, and the thing is, you can actually convince people by letting them realize that this future and now are not that separated, right? It's like climate change. We are facing the consequences right now. So suddenly your city is a, is a lake. huh? You have to get a little boat to get out of your house. Oh, my gosh. So there you go. And we can use that also as a level. Thank you. Um, sorry, if I could just follow up quickly. In that case study you gave, did the government offset the cost to the current fishers? Mm. Um, so they basically, or was it kind of, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Usually, usually you need to have a package, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another example is actually Hong Kong, and I don't know whether Luis is here. Uh, we did a study for the Hong Kong uh, government, WWF and, and the government, where they, they have 10,000, just 10,000 fishes and they're struggling how to deal with them. So we did a study to help them find a way to compensate fishes so that they, and 75% of them said under the right conditions, they will find another thing to do, right? So there's a lot of room in Hong Kong and, and, and yeah. You have to have a package to soften the blow, if you like, to allow this to happen. Yeah, and usually there's money in in what the returns that will come to pay for it. It just doesn't come today, right? Again. Yeah. 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 Mm. Thank you. You're yeah, welcome. Yeah. Thanks, Rashid. Um, Andrea, go ahead, please. Thanks, Colette. Thank you, Rashid, for for an excellent talk, and I was really glad to see uh, the mention of seven generations thinking and you know not seeing time as quite so so linear or disconnected so thank you for raising all of that um and i just wanted to jump in quickly too on on what sarah foster was asking that i think there are some examples of this that are embedded in indigenous communities and i think we just have to think about you know the scale that we're that we're turning to and it might be quite different but if we look at the unamagi institute of natural resources on the east coast of canada um, they have fisheries plans that are very much couched in that way of thinking of creating economic opportunity that doesn't jeopardize the economic opportunity of generations coming. And this is a cultural concept that I've raised in this space before, but it's that called netagulim, which is akin to sustainability, but it's about not jeopardizing ecology, economy, well-being now with mm -hmm. an eye for those in the, in the future as well. Um, Rashid, what I was hoping to raise, um, I was, I think it's so interesting what you are doing with the First Nations Fisheries Council, and I was hoping that you could just speak briefly a little bit more to, to what that has entailed um, for everyone here. And for those that don't know, the, the FNFC is a group based here in the Lower Mainland that represents uh, many BC First Nations, not all, to reconcile treaty and Aboriginal rights uh, with what is currently imposed uh, as, as fishing rights and, and restrictions in this country. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit more, Rashid, from you on that, if you can. Yeah, so, so my, my first real encounter with uh, Indigenous People First Nations was in Prince Rupert years ago. So we had a project, Tony Pitcher is not here. He had a project and we're all part of it. And we went to Prince Rupert and I was doing the economics, right? So I go up there not understanding much. I go up there and I, I put my economy and say, yeah, I'm coming here, we work together. And a lot of indigenous people came to our talk, you know. At first they thought we were DFO and they were coming to fight us, but they realized we we're UBC and then we became friends. That was nice, right? <laughs> so so and 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 so I, I go there and I talk this economics. And as I was talking, there was an elder just looking at me and smiling and I knew there was something I wasn't doing right, even before he, he said it. So when I finished, he said, you know, Rashid, we don't want you to value our fish. I said, why, sir? Why? When you know the value, you can bargain. When people come, you know how to ensure you get the value. He said, no, 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 no. Through history, 
whenever a value is put on our thing, we lose it. My God, I mean, this hit me so hard, right? And I had to reflect. And so I learned that you can't just go in and start talking or whatever. And that I pulled back and slowly, the, the Aboriginal Fisheries Council invited me to give a talk at their annual, I, they do it annually, uh, Fisheries Conference. And I did that and they kind of loved it because I, you know, I learned my lesson and I took in the important issues for the community. That led to them coming and we started this collaboration. And it was really very gentle and careful, right? It was two parties and we listened and share and then slowly we develop this method. So you really have to be, you know, this is co-creation at, 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 at the least, otherwise it doesn't work, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, just a big, big thank you to Rashid on behalf of um, the UBC's uh, Institute for Oceans and Fisheries. Uh, also for myself, thank you. It was really great to, to be able to hear your work on um, the power of the innocent D of discounting and then uh, the stories and infectious enthusiasm that, that gives life to your work. Um, it's exciting to see how you're stitching together decades um, of work here into a comprehensive narrative. So thank you for that.